Well, I had to get comfortable with being alone first. So it wasn't an overnight um, experience, I guess you would say. It was great to have space and time to reflect. So when I stopped partying and really made the decision, it's like when I quit smoking. The people that are doing the same thing, they want you to keep doing the same thing because then it validates their own behaviour and action. If you're changing your life and they're not, mm -hmm. they start feeling shame and guilt within themselves because it triggers something in them. So I ended up walking away and being alone. I actually uh, got a job. You're listening to the First Class Life Show hosted by Lindsay Vertner, a holistic personal development show for high achieving leaders who desire to maximize their impact while creating a life full of purpose, fulfillment and happiness. So grab a drink, grab your notebook and let's get started. Hey, 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 First Class family. Welcome back to another episode of the First Class Live Show with your host, Lindsay Bertner. That is me. And we have a very lovely guest all the way from Australia. Yes, our good mate, Trudy Pavlovsky. And I am excited to talk to her. I know that she has been through a lot of things that she's overcome in her life and she has been able to create the life of her dreams. So without further ado, you already know we got to hop right into this discussion with the lovely Trudy so that we can maximize our impact and create a life full of purpose, fulfillment, and happiness as leaders. So let's get right to it. Hey, Trudy. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm so excited. Yes, yes. I know it's going to be an awesome conversation. And I know just a little bit about your background and some of the things that you've overcome. But I want you to introduce to us, to the first class family, who is Trudy Pavlovsky? Like, give us the good tea. Peel back the curtains and, and let us know. Who are you, girl? <laughs> Ooh, I am, I guess, the eternal optimist. Um, I am a cat mum to two senior fur babies. I consider myself quite creative. And uh, for those of you that are into horoscopes, I'm a Gemini. So please don't hold that against me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> jokes. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm approachable and fun. But there's also a deeper side to me that I'm better over the years at sharing and being more open. <laughs> but um, I, I think I'm, um, I think ultimately I'm a bit of a dag who just likes to see the best in in everyone. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, part of the American vernacular, but a dag, someone who's not cool, not trendy, um, <laughs> is just you know your average person. But I. I'm, I'm that person that made good that wasn't expected to make good in life. So, yeah, that's that's me. Wow. So thank you for that vocab lesson with Zag. Uh, because Zag. I, I picked up on the contact but I'm glad you fully explained what a DAG was. I'm going to have to see if I can use that <laughs> in, well, a, in a sentence the rest of the day. That's the slang version of it. It's also the... The proper um, use of the word DAG is the, um, I can't believe we're going down this path, the scrappy bits of um, poop and waste that hang off um, a sheep's bottom before it gets shorn. That's the proper use of the word DAG, but in Australia we call anyone who's not cool and, a, you know, <laughs> they're a bit of a DAG. So... <laughs> Just so I you're not shocked it. if you go and look it up and you're like, wait, wait, hang on. She said it's someone who's not cool. So, yeah. Noted. So, um, note to self, whenever I go to visit Australia, I should not be like, oh, look at this tag. <laughs> People might raise an eyebrow a little bit. Got it. Got it. I won't do that. So I noticed that you mentioned that you are someone that wasn't really expected to make good of their life. And that comes out as, as a shock to me because what? Not truly. So could you expand a little further on, on what you meant by that? 
Um, so I'm, uh, I'm nearly 50. So where I grew up was a small country town. Everybody knew everybody and um, I'm a 70s baby. And back in those days, um, divorce wasn't uh, something that was socially acceptable. And my parents got divorced when I was quite young. And right from the word go, there was lots of judgment around uh, my family, uh, judgment from the church that there was something wrong with me. Um, I had a lot of trauma growing up, so I never quite fit in. I grew up a little bit faster than kids my age, so I was seen as a bit of a bit of a weirdo, <laughs> a bit of an anomaly. Um, I think generally because of uh, my family's history of um, there was a lot of instability that that judgment was put on to me. And then obviously in high school, I acted that out and dropped out of high school. And so I kind of uh, validated what a lot of people said about the Pavlovsky family, that we were no good. And that was something that I carried for a long time. I'm a Pavlovsky, I'm no good. Why do I even sort of bother sort of thing? And sort of lived into that um, title of being no good. So, but yeah, I've made good now. So I'm very, I'm very proud of myself. Yeah, but it all started back in childhood. Pardon? And and it's crazy because our childhood experiences are are tied to how we behave as young adults mm -hmm. and into adulthood. And it's important that we identify those and recognize them. So kudos to you for doing that. Uh, what would you say? was like the emotional journey that you went on knowing that here you are, you didn't have anything to do with the adults that came before you, their actions and their behaviors, but here is this societal judgment that is automatically being passed down to you. Yeah, there was, so I was lucky that I had the odd teacher in primary school and high school that um, oh. believed in me and would encourage me. And so those tiny little pockets of positive conversation, in spite of the trauma that I went through, um, the depression which started, dare I say, even in um, my younger years, but definitely escalated in my teenage years and in my 20s, there was still an underlying belief in there. And I think that's what kept me going um, in spite of the multiple times I tried to unalive myself, that there was something more for me, that I was actually destined for something special. And my life did have meaning, um, but that was like a very um, tiny echo that would pop up in my darkest hours and go, wait, hang on, remember that teacher said this or that teacher said that. But, you know, for a bulk of my life, there was a lot of judgment and guilt and self-punishment and... Um, acting into that role and living into that belief that I was no good until eventually I got to a point where it was, you know, completely give up or find the strength to, to fight through it and move through it and live into that other tiny little belief that would whisper in my ears sometimes that you are destined for more. You are here for a purpose. You are here for a reason. And ultimately, when I realized that I was the one common denominator in my own life, that the past, those people in the past didn't care whether I lived or died, and it was all up to me, that I was finally able to reach a point where I'm like, you know what, I am destined for something more. So it's been a bit of a, <laughs> a, bit of a rough journey, a bit of up and down <laughs> through my whole life, um, and it's taken me quite a while to get to this point, but, you know, I did it. So. Yes, and we are so glad that you did it. Now, I don't know if the First Class family caught this as, as they're tuned in with us, but you mentioned that you had moments where, you know, didn't want to be alive anymore. When was that first time that occurred for you? What was that like? Well, I first, um, back in the 80s, you know, suicide wasn't something that was really talked about. Um, mental health, self-harm, none of those things were ever topics of conversation. In Australia, there's very much the attitude of, you know, somebody else has it worse than you, just 
yeah. rack hardy, yeah. just get on with it. Um, stop being a crybaby and, and keep going. And so I first seriously thought about um, ending my life when I was um, a teenager. But I, I feel that if I had have understood the language, I probably would have felt it, you know, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, to be honest. Uh, I was deeply, deeply unhappy, uh, very traumatised, very abused. And <clears throat> but it wasn't until I was a teenager where I was started acting out on that but there was three times in my 20s where, you know, I ended up in hospital or a psychiatric ward or having to see a doctor. Um, but it was in those really dark moments that I really started to identify my strength as well. And it was that final time where, you know, I was, I, I said to myself, you can keep playing this scenario out. And this was before I was doing coaching and I didn't understand patterns and I didn't understand that I'd put myself into a place of victim. And I just knew that something had to change and it had to be me. That, you know, that, that white knight on his horse wasn't coming to rescue me, like the fairy tales say, that maybe I wasn't a princess. And um, I was a queen and it was up to me to actually make the decisions and take the actions to change my life. So that resulted in a, a six-month drug detox, me. leaving people behind, saying no mm. and just starting to say yes to who I was and who I wanted to be. Yeah. Nice, nice. I love that you mentioned that you had to make the decision to stop being a victim. Yeah. So what were some of those factors that went into you yeah. being able to make that decision? Some people don't even realize that they're playing the victim and, you know, causing the cycle to continue. Um, because, you know, I always say that whenever you're stuck in victim mode, you give up your power for change. And it sounds like you realize, like, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah. I, I got to break this victim mode that I'm in so that I can change. Yeah, well... I woke up in a car by the beach. I was covered in, uh, I, maybe I need to do a trigger warning for this, um, that I was covered in vomit. I'd attempted to take a whole load of pills. I'd cut my arms up. I'd taken illegal drugs. I drank alcohol and I woke up and I was in my car by the beach. The sun had risen. People were walking past. People were living their lives. And not one person stopped to check to see if I was okay. Mm. And that's when it really did hit me that if I wanted something different, if I didn't want to keep doing this and if I, I somehow understood that the past was the past and I needed to find a way to let it go, that I tried to ask for help and nobody came and helped, that... It really had to be me and, you know, that that was, I just don't think I can do it justice how powerful that, it was like an awakening, a reckoning, like something shifted completely in my body and it was just like, oh, I get it, I get it. I've been self-destructing my whole life. Nobody made me take the drugs. Nobody made me associate with certain people. I needed to take responsibility and not for other people's actions because what people have done to me is unkind. It's not right. There's, you know, it was bad stuff. But ultimately I chose to be in certain situations. And that was real, a real reclamation of my own personal power, that I wasn't helpless and that's when I made the decision to stop doing recreational drugs. I knew I needed to move away from certain people. Um, I needed to completely de detox myself and stop partying to mask the pain that I was feeling. And at that point, I didn't know how. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. But I knew I needed to find ways to stop being so angry and so bitter and that princess in the tower helpless and waiting and to really just go you know what 
I'm worth it. I'm worth it regardless of what mm-hmm. anybody else says or thinks or has done or thinks of my family or anything. I'm worth it because I'm worth it. So, yeah, it was such a powerful turning point for me. And I, you know, anyone who is in that space of where I was, like, you you can change, you can transform. I, I truly believe every single individual has value, no matter where you've come from or what you've been through, you are worthy of having it all. So that's my little soapbox rant, David. I'm just, it was such a powerful moment for me, it really was. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I can feel the power coming through because it is important to believe that you are worth it. And, you know, sometimes that's where people fall short is because they fall into these patterns. They fall into these cycles. They fall into the expectations that are thrust up on them through society or their family or friends or, you know, their community. Um, or, you know, they fall into the expectations of that were passed down to them from their families and things like that. And so you can get to a point where you feel like, you know, well, I'm not worthy of anything that I desire. I'm not worthy to dream big or to have goals or things like that. And and so I love that you had that moment of reckoning for yourself. And something that you said that really stood out to me because, you know, as leaders, we can sometimes not move and not take action because we don't have a plan. But you mentioned that you knew that things needed to change. You didn't know how they were going to change and what you were going to do, but you knew that things needed to change. So with that said, what was that journey like as you started to take the actions to change, even though you didn't have a roadmap on how to get there? Well, it really does. I think anything in life um, really starts with that decision and, you know, just making, deciding what you want. And I decided I didn't want to be hurting anymore. I didn't want to be punishing myself for deeds done to me. And um, it really began with going, okay, I need to reflect. So I definitely looked at what was going on in my life. And, you know, the first thing was stopping partying and stopping the recreational drugs and stop doing the things that numbed my life and my experience and finding the courage to face them. And I um, Mm -hmm. went and saw my GP and, you know, we discussed medication. We decided medication wasn't what I needed. Um, And it was just taking myself away from the influences that kept me in the space that I was in. And it was pretty scary. It was pretty lonely because my um, party community, that was my circle of (laughs) non-judgment. So um, the the first decision was to detox, um, detox the chemicals out of my system, detox the negative friends, um, the people that didn't support me. Um, And then I went and after I think it was about a six-month detox really before I felt really good. Um, Now, my my last attempt at unaliving myself, there had been some massive trauma um, before that as well and it was, you know, six months of um, blocking out some pretty horrific things. So I've, I've granted myself grace in that moment and, you know, really given myself a lot of love around that. Uh, But it was definitely, you know, really, you know, picking one thing at a time, taking the step, the next thing, but just knowing at the end that I wanted to love, find a way to love myself. I wanted to feel happy again. I wanted to get back on the path of living a purposeful, meaningful life. So after I detoxed, I went and got a job and uh, really started to take responsibility for my finances again um, because I'd been you know, living off the uh, cash purse of my mother who really didn't know how to help me and support me and she did everything she could. But ultimately, once again, the decision to be whole and healthy and happy had to come from me. So it was a process. It was a good um, 
good six, 12 months before I was sort of really clean of the, the um, chemical influences and settled back into a job and really clear of some of the people that, you know, in hindsight, that wonderful gift of hindsight that I thought were my friends, but really didn't have my best interests at heart at all. <laughs> we live and learn, right? <laughs> Um, but it really, once again, it just, just it just started with a decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It started with a decision. I like that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's funny yeah. that you said, you know, the people that you thought were your friends, because I know I've, I've been blessed to be able to travel all over the place and meet a lot of people. And sometimes you come across leaders that have a bunch of yes men around them. And, you know, maybe <laughs> something's a little off or something, maybe they're not doing quite right, you know, should be doing something else in line with integrity and things like that. And, and I know as I think about my own leadership journey is that I don't want to be around a bunch of yes men. And I feel like if you can't critique me whenever I'm doing something that maybe isn't the best judgment on my end or is out of alignment with my values, then we aren't really friends and I should be able to do the same for you. Yep. So I think, you know, it's important yep. that we find that support system that says, Lindsay girl, Trudy girl, like, all right, yeah. you're wilding you out doing? right now. <laughs> you serious? Yeah. Looking for amazing products to help boost your first class lifestyle? Then head over to firstclasslifeshop.com where you can treat yourself to personal development books and workbooks, lifestyle affirmation cards, adult coloring books, mugs, notebooks, hoodies, t-shirts, leggings, and more. All products were designed to help you master your mindset, walk in your purpose, and live your first class life because you deserve it. So treat yourself today at firstclasslifeshop.com. Again, that's firstclasslifeshop.com. I think I have a, a bit of a, a motto that one of my mentors taught me, that feedback is the breakfast of champions. And, you know, being open mm. to receiving feedback, I at one point in my life was not open to receiving feedback. But I really understand now, and I hope the listeners do as well, that feedback from the right people, it's got to be the right people, you know, people that are experts, people that have been there, done that, people that you know do have your best interests at heart. Feedback is the breakfast of champions and being open to that because I'm like you, I don't want to be surrounded by, by yes men. I want to be surrounded by people that, you know, want to see me succeed and you know, yes, people mm -hmm. aren't really going to help you on that that path or not at the accelerated rate that I think most leaders that I meet want to be succeeding at. So, yeah, definitely agree with you there. Mm -hmm. So what was that like as far as finding this new community, this new tribe, these new friends? Because I know I hear that a lot just in general where people be like, oh, nobody supports me or, you know, the people I'm around, they don't have the same goals and visions. And it's like, well, first of all, you, if you don't have it around you, you need to make yourself uncomfortable and go outside of your comfort zone and find them. Yeah. But what were some of those steps that you took to essentially create a whole new group of friends and family? Well, I had to get comfortable with being alone first. So it wasn't an overnight um, experience, I guess you would say. It was great to have space and time to reflect. So when I stopped partying and really made the decision, it's like when I quit smoking. The people that are doing the same thing, they want you to keep doing the same thing because then it validates their own behaviour and action. If you're changing your life and they're not, mm -hmm. they start feeling shame and guilt within themselves because it triggers something in them. So I ended up walking away and being alone. I actually uh, got a job and ended up moving interstate for six months. So I live in Melbourne, Australia, and I moved to Adelaide for a job. Didn't know anyone, um, made friends with my housemate who I'm still friends with, you know, 17 years later. And 
just through, I just immersed myself into my work and, you know, shifting the identity of from party princess to, uh, you know, corporate Trudy and working my way up the, the retail ladder. Now, I'm by nature, I'm actually an introvert, which most people don't believe, but I do actually enjoy my alone time. And I have a small select circle of friends. But I, I completely walked away from everything to restart. And then um, eventually, you know, a decade later, I ended up resettling back in Melbourne. I've been back here for seven years now. And I reconnected with a few people and just used the amazing power of online to make a few more friends. But I actually made lifetime friends while I was in Adelaide. One of them's moved to Sydney, some of them are still in Adelaide, I'm in Melbourne, and we don't see each other often, but I know I can pick up the phone and call them any time. And I have a few uh, close friends in, in Melbourne now as well. But I find for me personally, being the, the introvert, um, I'm quite happy alone now because I've got so much peace in my own mind. I don't need the distracting chatter of 100 people around me to be able to feel okay, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes people struggle being alone with themselves or with their own thoughts. Yep. And so even if all of the voices around them is very chaotic, um, they get comfortable in that chaos. And so it sounds like you've found your solace, you know, drowning out all of the noise of other people and, and being okay with you and your oneness. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very happy with, with who I am. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we love that for you here you. on the First Class Life Show. And uh, so I think that this will be a good time to play a little game. Okay. So let me uh, grab my my timer here. You up for a game? All right. Let's okay. Go. So this is called First Class Favorites, okay. right? And it's really easy. All you have to do is fill in the blank. I'll say, what's your favorite dot, dot, dot. And you fill in the blank. Okay. okay. Simple enough, right? Yep. <laughs> but you have to answer in 10 seconds or less. All right. So if you miss the buzzer, then all of the first class family that's tuned in right now, they're going to have to have to uh, have a consequence oh, for no. missing the buzzer. <laughs> no pressure. What would you like their consequence to be? It can be anything, whatever you want their consequence to be for missing the buzzer. Oh, um, oh, pressure. Already under pressure and going blank. Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, what, what do you suggest? What's a fun consequence? Um, well, um, it's it's all going to be a matter of perspective, whether it's fun okay. or not. So I know uh, the last guest was like, if I miss the buzzer, you got to do 10 push-ups. Now, for me, that is a high punishment. But for the health pe healthy people out there, they'll be like, oh, yes, let me get some extra reps in. <laughs> oh, goodness. That would that would be a hardcore punishment. Um, mm -hmm, take a shot. Okay. Um, I have to sing... Um, Happy birthday or <laughs> something. I don't know. That's the first thing that came into my head. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have I have to I have to sing a couple of lines of happy birthday. And with my husky voice right now, that might not be fun for everybody. And so, look, she even took the pressure off of you guys because she gave herself the consequences rather than you. So, lucky, lucky you. <clears throat> All right, so let's get started. We'll start with something easy. What is your favorite food? Go. Oh, I love spaghetti bolognese or lasagna, like that really carb-filled, meaty Italian food. Yummy. Mm-hmm. I actually had spaghetti for lunch today, Ooh, nice. so not spaghetti bolognese, but <laughs> we are friends for life. Okay, okay. So, see that. What is your favorite movie? Go. I love Starship Troopers. 
you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's that mm-hmm. line, you want to live forever. And it's like killing all those big bugs that attack the earth. Like it's so cheesy, but it just makes me laugh so much. The acting is so bad. Yeah, I love that movie. That's funny. Um, it made me think. I was at um, a bowling alley not too long ago, and they had like an arcade and everything. And so one of the games was the Starship game, and you had to like shoot the aliens and and the little creatures and like flying at you. I lost. But <laughs> so next one. What is your favorite book title and author? Go. I have a real um, like I've got heaps of personal development books. But I have a really sentimental attachment to um, the book's called Black Beauty and it was from my childhood and I absolutely love it. Did I take too long to answer? Black Beauty. Yeah, it's a story about a horse. <laughs> yep. uh, what's the author's name? Black Beauty. Uh, I can't remember the author's name. Anna Swell or Sewell or something? Yeah. We'll have to, you know what? I want it's a story of a horse, Black of all things. Business. Sorry? <laughs> I said, I wonder if that's the same Black Beauty book that's popular here in the U.S. as well. Like the cover that I'm picturing. So It's, we'll it's a story of a horse that's but yes. raised into, um, it's a well-bred horse. Um, it as uh, being gets ridden really hard it has a fall it scars its knees it's no longer good for a gentleman's stable and it falls on hard times and it gets rescued in the end and it sees its old friend and oh yeah but from a personal development perspective if you want a personal uh development book as well um uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway was um, the very first personal development book I ever read. And Dr. Susan Jeffers, who has since passed, it was so powerful and influential. So there you go. I'll give you two. Bonus book. <laughs> yes, because you, you missed the buzz, buzzer on that one. And you were right on the author. I just looked it up. It was Anna Sewell. Oh, beautiful. Or, I don't know how you say it. S-E-W-E-L-L. Yeah. So um okay okay so everybody listen you got to break out into random song at some point throughout the rest of this day uh for at least 10 seconds because since she missed that buzzer um, what did i miss what is your favorite what did what? the buzzer for the book oh did i happy birthday mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. you anyone who's listening <laughs> to the podcast I think you're fabulous, and I believe in you. How's that? My own version. (laughs) Nice little Mm sample. Next one is, what is your favorite um, song, title, and artist? Go. I am really into a song called Lucky Day by, it's a brand new song. Her name is Nicola... Nicola, oh, I can't remember her last name. Like I've literally only discovered this song like a week ago and it is so cute and it makes me think of like the the 40s flappers or the 30s flappers and it's just the cutest song ever. Um, I can look up the artist's name but it's just so much fun and it's just such good energy and it's so cute so um (laughs) let me nicola roberts yeah it's the cutest song ever please please look it up everybody it's just adorable it just makes you feel so good it makes you want to dance yeah i'm definitely gonna google it because i like dancing so Gonna look that up. Okay, what is your favorite place to travel specifically? Go. Oh, favorite place. I'm not really, I'm a homebody, Uh, but I do love to travel to Sydney or Adelaide Mm -hmm. to visit my friends. I know that's probably a bit lame. I've I've been overseas a few times. (laughs) um, To travel anywhere from Australia, it costs a small fortune. Um, But yeah, traveling to see my friends has the most meaning. Yeah. Nice. I like that. I like that. 
Okay, last question. What is your favorite activity to do to relax? Go. Well, I'm a huge fan of power naps. And also, I'm a real daydreamer. And I'm happy to just sit on the couch with a cat on my lap, stare out the window and daydream about my dreams, the things I want to achieve, um, being a rock star one day, uh, the book I want to write. I spend a lot of time in my head, which obviously I think you can figure out in the past was a problem. But now, <laughs> now I just love imagining and daydreaming and creating and thinking of the blogs I want to write. And yeah, yeah, that's relaxing for me. No. Nice. Yeah. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So thank you for playing First Class Favorites. And to the First Class family that's tuned in right now, guess what? Make sure you are a member of our private Patreon community because you will have access to our uniquely curated First Class Favorite list of things, okay? You know, Oprah has her Oprah's favorite things. We have our first class favorite things. Nice. And so on that list, you will find a reading list, our song playlist, our favorite places to travel, and our favorite activities for self-care. So got to be a member of our Patreon community. You can click the link to join that and lots of other bonus content and footage as well. So thanks for playing first class favorites, Trudy. Oh, that was fun. A bit of pressure, but it was fun. <laughs> Are you loving the First Class Live Show? Then join our private Patreon community. Not only will you help to support our ability to provide you with great content, but you can also get exclusive perks like bonus videos and resources, discounts, episode transcripts, and more. So what are you waiting for? Join today at patreon.com forward slash first class life. Again, that's Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash first class life. <laughs> yes, and you only missed one buzzer. So everybody only has to break out into random song one time for the rest of the day. So awesome. Let's get back into this discussion. Now, I know you just mentioned that in the past it was an issue being in your head, whereas now it it's fun to be in your head and with your thoughts and things like that. So what would you say is one of the key factors that helped you to make that switch where you turned your negative thoughts into positive thoughts? I think when I started studying coaching and human potential and personal development um, and, you know, neuroplasticity and the science of the brain and all of those things put together. And I realized and I learned that our memories and our past and all of these things, they're just these microscopic electrical chemical impulses in my brain. That's all they are. And I can clear those charges. I can work through it. I can let it go. And all we really have now is this, this present moment. We are constantly creating our future. And I'd much rather be forward thinking and looking in, you know, the forward direction rather than always looking back at the past. And the past really actually, actually can't hurt me anymore. Um, and it really doesn't matter in the scheme of things for me knowing that this is a moment that counts, you know, and I get to decide and choose how each moment is for me. That was mind blowing for me. I know I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, a lot of your listeners, if not all of your listeners are kind of probably going, yeah, of course. But a little country kid that I was that had been told some pretty horrible things and experienced some unkind things, that was really big I was like oh I actually am you know what is the the saying the captain of my fate the master of my soul like whatever that saying is it's like that's actually true oh sweet I don't have to worry about the past anymore 
yeah, it was that was that was big and learning to meditate and to use breathing and shifting the narrative in my head and the questions that I would ask myself was huge. And that 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 probably the biggest mm -hmm. things in that, you know, being able to be in my head and be comfortable. And, you know, I still, and I'm, I'm going to yeah. be really honest and transparent here, I still have moments where stuff comes up and, you know, whether you want to call it imposter syndrome or um, just negative yeah. thoughts or, you know, they still show up. But I just call them echoes, echoes from the past that mm -hmm. are just pointing me in the direction that maybe there's some more wisdom to be found by looking back because I look at everything that's happened to me Instead of from a, a judgment or shame or guilt, I just look at it as opportunity to get wisdom and learnings from any of those situations to improve myself to move forward. So, yeah, that's where my head's at now. Now I know. <laughs> yes, yes. I noticed you mentioned um, imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. and so you know that comes up a lot whenever you're talking with leaders, especially if they don't feel worthy enough of the title that they may have or the role that they may hold in their family or community or workplace. And so what are some tips that leaders can use to battle whenever they are feeling like an imposter? I, I used to have this um, belief that I had to fight the imposter voice, like it was this battle. And I'm like, you know what? I'm actually just creating an internal struggle in my own mind and I want my life to be full of ease and grace and fun. And I actually, um, actually did a, a, a short course on it about befriending this voice in your head and, you know, being aware that, you know, and this is my take on it, that the voice, when it does show up, it's, you know, it might have a concern, but if you examine that from a place and of love and, you know, a lens of opportunity, that I use it as a guidance system, that it's my friend, this voice, it's a part of me, it's a part of who I am. And it's wanting to love me and keep me safe and protect me and make sure that I'm okay. And if you spend some time in my head, I talk to myself a lot. <laughs> so, but I have a dialogue with that voice rather than letting it be the, the most powerful voice to so stand beside it and go, okay, cool. What do you think I'm missing? What do I need to look at in this situation to be able to take the next step? What reassurance does my mind need to know that this is okay and that I'm okay? So I, I, I've stopped fighting my inner dialogue and I look to it for wisdom and guidance. Even in those moments where it might say, you're not good enough for this, you can't do this, you know, you're whatever. Um, it's like, okay, why do I actually think this? Is there fact in this? Is there something to prepare for? Is there learning? Is there wisdom? And I thank it for its feedback and then I just generally do the thing anyway. <laughs> just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> but no no fighting in my head, no thank internal you. battles. You know, I love myself now and, you know, I don't, I don't want to be my own enemy. I've, I've done that too long. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the scene, um, you know, that we are our own worst critic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we are our own worst yeah. enemy. And usually it's true because we're fighting this battle in our mind. Yeah. And once we can, you know, overcome yeah. the battle in our mind, we can truly open up a world of opportunity to be exactly what it is yeah. that we desire to be. Because there's this whole thing about judgment, right? And you're right. <laughs> we are our own harshest critics. We judge ourselves the harshest. But I think this came out from when I had my awakening when I was 28. It was like the things that we're judging ourselves for or the people that we think are going to judge us or, you know what, most of them don't actually care. It's, it's, it's totally irrelevant. Like, you know, the, 
I would, I would hope for all the listeners that they are surrounded by people that want to see them succeed or they choose to curate that in their life moving forward. They're not sitting back going, oh. they might wonder why you're not taking action on things because they see you in your wholeness and your completeness and your abilities and your talents, but that's not negative judgment. So, yeah, it's, it's just making friends with that voice and going, yeah, you know what? This isn't a judgment. This is just an observation. And you know what? How can we move forward from this? Thanks for the feedback. Let's just do it anyway because belief is not found until the action is taken. Anything before you take the action, it's just an estimation, a guess, a maybe. So, yeah. I'm found. I like that. Belief is not found. Until you say it again, because I, I messed it up already. Right. Like I, you said it, and I, I was like, "Ooh, yes. yes!" And I got stuck in it, and now I didn't mess it up. Belief is only to be found on the other side of action. Anything before that, it's just an estimation, a guess, a maybe, a who knows. So you'll never know until you take the leap and do the thing. And that's a real guiding motto for me. Like whenever I have a moment where I'm like, "Ooh," it's like, just do it. Anything you're imagining, because we imagine worst case scenario, it's going to be nothing like that. And it usually always works out. You just got to take the action and yes. do the thing. See, I love it. <laughs> take the action. Take the action. So listen here, First Class Family. If you are new to the show, then First Class Life is actually an acronym that stands for all of the different characteristics and skills that you want to embody into your lifestyle to create a first class life full of purpose, fulfillment, and happiness. And I'm not going to get into those. If you want to know what those, um, those traits and skills are, then make sure you go back and listen to the very first episode of the First Class Life Show, or you can head to firstclasslifeshop.com and buy the book, First Class Life, 10 Key Factors to Create a Life Full of Purpose, Fulfillment, and Happiness. Meanwhile, we want to ask our lovely guest, Trudy, which key factor of First Class Life do you feel that you resonate with the most? Oh, it's, it's a bit of a toss-up, but I think, um, I think self-worth. Yeah. Yeah, I think when you have nice. that, yeah. everything else will fall into place. And it wasn't until I truly, truly saw my, my worthiness and owned my self-worth that I was able to expand and move into five-figure months in my business. And that's only a pretty recent occurrence. Um, was able to really make some big decisions and put myself first in a few situations that things weren't bad but things were average and I made the decision that I'm worth more than average. I'm worthy of the best. So self-worth is, is a huge thing because I think one of the reasons I'm here is I too want a first class life. I do want to have the best. I want to feel the best, be the best. And I have no shame or judgment around that, but that all comes from owning my self-worth and my worthiness. Yes, I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Now, let us know, how do you impact the world as a leader in your own right? I, uh, I really believe that everybody, everybody is magical. Everybody is beautiful. Everybody has a purpose. And whatever that purpose is, for some people, it's big life-changing things. For some people, it's living their happiest life and raising a beautiful family. Like for me, there's no judgment around whatever you feel that you're here for. But for me, my driver is really supporting people and especially I mainly work with women to own that, to step in, to embrace their worthiness, to take the things that people said were wrong with them and to polish those things up into beautiful diamonds and make that their greatest strength. You know, for me, I've always, I've loved attention, but I've been shamed and punished and vilified for that for so many years of my life. Um, you know, for those things that we're told we don't 
shouldn't want. I want you to want those things and I want you to have those things. So that's um, that's where where I find myself landing with the work that, that I do. Giving yourself full permission to be all of who you are with no filters. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Nice, nice. Now, how do you serve the world? Do you have any products or services that you would like to share with everyone? Um, I have two things. I have for, for those, you know, getting started and really wanting to step into really embracing their happiness. Um, I have a, a free happiness journal. Uh, it's just got 100 prompts. So, for, you know, the people that like to write, you can actually get a little book and journal and write on those prompts. Uh, for people that aren't writers, people like me who are daydreamers, you can just take one of those prompts and feel into it and daydream and imagine your life, how it is when you're feeling like that or doing that thing. Um, and for those that want to do a bit more of a deep dive and um, have some money available to invest in themselves, I run a program called Embrace. Um, now I'm in Australia, so it's four ninety five in Australian dollars. But I think if you pay in US dollars, it's even less from your end. Um, so that's a, that's a that's a plus if you're not living in Australia. Um, but this is a, a program where we embrace, you know, through the use of shadow values, we embrace those parts of ourselves that we've been told are bad and. You know, golden values are the ones we're happy to share with the world because they're not threatening and, you know, like trust and respect and people people like you for having those values. But if you want control or attention or you want to feel superior or any of those kinds of things, um, we're told that that's bad and we should not want that. So I work with that stuff to really allow you to fully step into who you are. So that supports my purpose for being here and removing shame, judgment, guilt, any of those things that you have towards yourself. We peel those back, take those things away and just let you show up truly authentic and all of who you are um, in your space of, of wholeness and completeness. Yeah. So that's that's Embrace. And where can I find that happiness? Um, if you go to my website, um, www.trudypavlovsky.com and click the banner on the homepage, you can get the happiness journal there. And also, if you're curious about Embrace, you want to know a little bit more about it, it's a self-study program and uh, four times a year I run a live um version of it where we have a month together where I support you via lives to get any questions answered you have around it and you have lifetime access to the the modules so you're always supported to step into who you are you're never alone I just hate the thought of people being alone so that is also available on my website as well yep Anybody that's listening to just the audio version of today's show, it's Trudy, T R U D I Pavlovsky, P A V L O B S K Y. Um, but you can always just click on the show notes and click the link directly. So we've got you covered. No worries there. Trudy, Trudy, let us know how we can find you, how we can connect with you, follow you out here on these internet streets. Um, where can we do that? Oh, pretty much um, if you, my name's pretty unique. I have never met another Trudy Pavlovsky. So if you Google me or search me, um, I'll show up. Um, probably, probably the best place is Facebook, um, Instagram, and um, I'm having a bit of fun with TikTok at the moment as well, just for some giggles. So they're, they're the main places that you'll be able to find me. So my Facebook is Trudy Sparkles Pavlovsky. The Sparkles is my nickname. And uh, Trudy Pavlovsky, I think, on Instagram as well. So, yeah. Yep. And if you, if you come and find me, let me know that you, you listen to the podcast. Let me know whether you sign up for a program or the journal. Just please let me know that you found me here because that would just be awesome. 
love to know where people find me from. Mm -hmm. Yes, me too. And I don't think I follow you on TikTok, so we'll have to find each other. On Excellent. There. I like to have fun on TikTok too. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thank you for being such a great guest on the First Class Live show. And as we wrap up, do you have any final advice on how we can create our first class life? It really is decision and action and finding ways within yourself to go, this is what I desire for me. This is what I desire and go out there and be hungry for it and find ways to achieve your dreams because you are worthy. You don't have to sacrifice who you are for anyone else. And today is the best day to start. Mm, today is the best day to start. What a way to end it. Yes. Well, thank you again for being a guest on this show. And thank you, First Class Family, for tuning in because I know you could be doing anything in the world right now, but you are spending your time here with us and we are forever grateful. So continue to be the high achieving leader that you are and go out there and maximize your impact while creating your first class life full of purpose, fulfillment, and happiness. You deserve it. Bye. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. But please be sure to subscribe to the First Class Life Show. And don't forget to rate, leave a review, and join our private community so that we can continue to provide you with great personal development conversations to help you maximize your impact while creating a life full of purpose, fulfillment, and happiness. You deserve it. Do you want to be surrounded by other high achieving women who are working on their goals just like you? Are you looking for your circle that's passionate about their own growth yet still wants to see you shine? Do you desire to be supported through collaborations and connections instead of competition? Then Cowork and Chill is your place to be. Cowork and Chill is a hybrid of virtual co-working and virtual networking. It's a community of women who are striving to build living legacies. This is the space to create meaningful relationships with other equally yoked women where you're being poured into just as much as you pour out. So if you're looking for your crew for support of accountability, then sign up today at coworkandchill.com. That's C-O-W-O-R-K-A-N-D-C-H-I-L-L coworkandchill.com.